All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we're joined by Marine Brigadier General James F. Glenn, who is the Deputy Commanding General of Special Operations Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve. Uh, General Glenn uh, is currently um, uh, briefs us from Baghdad, Iraq, and is uh, responsible for uh, U.S. Special, special Operations activities uh, in Iraq specifically. Uh, with that, we'll start with a radio check. General Glenn, sir, how do you hear us? I have you very well, Adrian. Thanks. How about me? Very clearly. Um, why don't we get started, sir, with uh, if you have an opening statement for us? Say that again? Sir, we'll get started uh, if you have an opening statement for us. Okay, yeah, sure. If I could open up with a few comments and then we'll turn it over to you there for questions. So good morning, everyone. Iraqi security forces continue to pursue the few ISIS fighters that seek to threaten the people of Iraq and clear previously ISIS-occupied areas, making them safe for residents the campaign against ISIS has resulted in over four and a half million people in Iraq liberated from the evil of ISIS, and we congratulate the government of Iraq on their success and are proud to stand beside them. However, we must not lose sight of the fact that much work remains to ensure the enduring defeat of this evil terrorist ideology. ISIS has demonstrated its desire to return to its terrorist roots with the bombings and attacks that have killed innocent civilians in Ramadi, Nazaria, Baghdad, and elsewhere over the past several weeks. Our Iraqi partners continue to provide security, which will increasingly include policing and border control functions to prevent the migration and reemergence of the ISIS threat. Through this success, the Coalition Joint Task Force remains committed to working with our Iraqi partners to root out and destroy the remaining ISIS fighters and the influence they attempt to peddle. We anticipate this will take some time since ISIS fighters are hiding in the mountains and amongst the civilian population, but it is necessary in order to ensure the sustained security to Iraq and guarantee the safety of the Iraqi people. The ISF has proven itself a legitimate fighting force that has and will continue their momentum, provide security for the people of Iraq, and quell the rise of new insurgencies. This has been shown in the last few weeks as the ISF has destroyed over 100 IEDs and thousands of pounds of explosives across Iraq. As we look forward to the next stage of the campaign, the coalition will continue to assist in consolidating gains made over the past few years. This involves a stabilization of security and essential services, focused predominantly in areas where ISIS once dominated, and our Iraqi partners will make this happen. This does not consist of nation building or large construction projects. It instead focuses on returning the nation and people of Iraq to a state of normalcy. Residents can concentrate on earning a living, taking care of their families. It en means enabling local governance, moving towards self-sufficiency. In other words, getting back to a normal life, free from the threat of ISIS and ensuring it doesn't return. The CJTF will continue to be value added to our partners by providing training, equipment, advice, and assistance that enables security and ultimately expanding the government's and non-governmental organizations access to offer assistance to the people of Iraq, which will ultimately lead to more regional and global stability. The government of Iraq is currently focused in providing essential services for people most affected by the campaign against ISIS. This is evident across Iraq as schools continue to open, people return to their homes, and local security forces are established. Several weeks ago, the Iraqi police conducted a graduation ceremony for 300 new police officers. An international aid agency has provided over 280,000 people across Iraq with access to clean water. Iraqi soldiers have helped repair desks so the children can return to school. And the United Nations Migration Agency recently announced that since 2013, the number of Iraqis that have returned to their homes exceeds the number of displaced Iraqis previously reported. For us in the Special Operations Joint Task Force here in Iraq, as an element of the CJTF, we continue to work with Iraqi security forces in many training missions. Since the beginning of January 2015, the coalition has helped train over 120,000 Iraqi security forces to include the Counterterrorism Force, 
Ministry of Interior and Ministry of Defense Forces. Within the past couple months, a thousand Iraqi men have graduated from the counterterrorism services basic training and 500 more are scheduled to graduate from CTS in a coming week. There are about 4,000 Iraqis who are currently undergoing coalition enabled training as well. And the Sojidif works closely with counterterrorism, commando, and SWAT forces to ensure violent extremism doesn't threaten the livelihood of the people of Iraq ever again. There are professional and capable forces committed to the future of Iraq, and we quite honestly take pride in their successes. I'll share with you an example that demonstrates their professionalism. During the height of conflict in Mosul, there was a CTS soldier on guard who observed several ISIS fighters moving towards his position. With no time to warn his teammates, he engaged one of the fighters. The four remaining ISIS fighters unleashed a hail of gunfire on the CTS position, hitting his particular CTS soldier five times. With bravery, he continued to defend his position as another ISIS fighter attempted to enter through the back of the house. CTS soldier was able to shoot the fighter before he entered the home, but not before the combatant was able to detonate his suicide belt. The blast from the detonation threw the already wounded CTS soldier into a wall, further injuring him. Still fighting, however, now alongside his awakened teammates, they were able to drive away the remaining ISIS fighters. And his actions reflect the courage, tenacity, and strength it takes to be a member of the elite counterterrorism service here in Iraq and explain a little bit about the culture of the organization. We applaud the successes of other elements of the Iraqi security forces, just about all of whom we've personally seen in action against ISIS. Their success has been evident time and again in the dismantling of threats and tyranny held on communities. We see this not only through the defeat of ISIS on the battlefield, but also through the marked drop in ISIS propaganda. Although ISIS has been militarily defeated, we recognize the post-conflict challenges they present. As we recognize these challenges, we wish to extend our sympathies to those who were killed and injured in the suicide attack on a Baghdad market just yesterday. This attack is another example of the cowardice, evil, and the desperate acts that ISIS and other violent extremists who remain, want to remain relevant throughout this area of operation will execute. We're dedicated to working with our partners on the permanent defeat of ISIS. The coalition will be here to help as we have been thus far. And we look forward to the future that we all see as a safe, secure Iraq where people can live their lives freely with a government dedicated to protecting them. And with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks, sir. We'll start with Joe Tabbitt from Al Hora. Uh, General Glenn, Glenn uh, I would like to ask you about uh, the border force that the U.S. is backing in eastern Syria. <coughs> uh, if you could explain, give us more details about this force and what are the implications of this decision on Turkey when we heard this morning uh, the Turkish president saying that the Turkish military will attack Efren and mainly the YPG in Afrin. So if you could address that, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a lot of information on that particular subject. As it was stated in the opening, my emphasis here in Baghdad is on, op on operations in Iraq. And so what I can tell you is, as I mentioned, uh, as our emphasis here, the Iraqi security force emphasis returns and focuses on local policing and securing their borders. Uh, as you're aware, they, ISIS has tried to take advantage of areas such as that that would be seen as vulnerabilities. So I can, I can tell you that, that that is important for the Iraqi security forces and something they're focused on going forward. Next to Lori Mill Warren with uh, Kurdistan 24. Hi, General. Thank you very much for, for this briefing. Since your special operations, I wonder, and I'm Kurdistan 24, we hear of the Peshmerga and think of them as a kind of conventional army, but are there, is there a special operations unit within the uh, Kurdish forces? Uh, 
had a little bit of trouble hearing you. I think you asked uh, about the Kurdish forces and uh, what kind of capabilities they have. Um, across Iraq, the, the security forces are arrayed to handle the situations that are, are presented to them. And so, uh, as an example, I think about Kirkuk, where they have both a SWAT and a commando unit that are capable of handling any and all threats that emerge. And I think you'll find similarly, we find similarly in just about every uh, large population center that you'll have some force that's focused exclusively on counterterrorism and the special weapons and tactics that would come with a police SWAT unit. Maybe I could make sure, is there an equivalent of special forces within the Peshmerga, distinct from the regular Peshmerga, like there is, say, in the Iraqi army or in the U.S. army? No, there, there's no element that's distinguished separate uh, that I'm aware of within the Peshmerga or, or any of the forces. Okay, and let me ask you also about, there are news reports that the Iraqis are preparing to an offensive against ISIS around Tuzkermatu. Is there coordination still ongoing between the Peshmerga and the Iraqi forces in attacking these ISIS remnants, do you know? That one was a little bit hard to hear. Uh, could you could you say the question again? I caught Tuz Kermatu and the Kurds are the Iraqi forces in Peshmerga. Okay, there, there are news reports that Iraq, the Iraqi forces are preparing an offensive against ISIS remnants around Tuz Kermatu, which is very, you know, one of the disputed areas. Is there coordination? between the Peshmerga and the Iraqi army for that is still ongoing for such an offensive, or would that be the Iraqi army alone? Would, would you be familiar with that? Yeah, I'm familiar with, uh, with the situation in the area of Tuz Kermatu, and I know that it, um, like any place that has that kind of challenge, uh, the the challenges to security that would put at risk the stability of the local area, that it has the attention of any security force in the area. And, and so at a military level, there, there is always discussions between any of the forces that could cooperate to achieve security in a local area, and that is the case in Tuz Kermatu. Next to Jeff Shogel with Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you, General. Has ISIS become an insurgency? If so, has the mission changed to counterinsurgency? Hey, thanks for that question, Jeff. Um, I would say that there, it would be too early to make that kind of an assessment. I would tell you that I certainly look for those types of indicators. However, uh, it, it's just too soon. There are still remnants of ISIS who reside in a cellular structure, who seek to bring instability to local areas, in particular population centers. And that remains, as it has for some time, the focus of the Iraqi security forces and their counterterrorism forces specifically, is to not allow those elements to form into a network or something that could look like an insurgency. If I could follow up, if you have cells of ISIS committing terrorist acts, how is that not an insurgency? Jeff, there, there's no indicator of any coordination. Uh, it, it's merely a matter of, of disparate cellular structures trying to 
have some legitimacy, some recognition. And frankly, to be at this point, to be disruptive. I think that's what you saw uh, in the double suicide vest attack in Baghdad, which is a disruptive act on the behalf of an organization focused on violence. All right, next to uh, Lita from AP. Hi, General. Lita Baldor with AP. Um, just one quick follow-up on Jeff's question. You said there's no indicator of any coordination. Are you talking about ISIS um, as a whole across Iraq, that there is no indication that there is any coordination within the terror group at all? Lita, what I'm, what I'm saying is that there are, there are remnants of ISIS who have been isolated and face some pretty dire choices. And they are to try to come together in with, with potentially with other elements or to try to relocate somewhere else. And what the government of Iraq and their very capable security forces are focused on is ensuring that that doesn't happen. To lock them down where they are and to give them no alternatives but to be captured or killed. Can you, um, can you give me an assessment of how much of your force is actively advising and assisting and working with the Iraqi units versus how much of it is you know, just doing sort of broader base training? On the special operations specifically, Lita, I would say about, I, I mean, I'm pulling it out of thin air to be honest, but the vast majority, I mean, 75, 80% of what we're doing is advising and assisting our Iraqi counterparts in, in an active role. Increasingly, the good news story is increasingly, they execute an operation on their own. And the advice and assistance we're providing them is in the planning and in the, in the post-operational uh, aspect of exploiting what they've gotten when they have captured the individual who they're looking for and any of the associated materials they might uh, have available to exploit. Thank you. Next to Tara Kopp with Military Times. Hi, thank you for doing this. Um, I wanted to talk about contractors for a minute. Uh, over the last year, the number of contractors in Iraq uh, has increased significantly, even though major operations have dwindled. Um, is the U.S. transitioning a lot of these roles to contractors? And if not, um, why would that footprint be getting bigger if the kinetic mission there has uh, reduced? Thanks for the question, Tara. I honestly am not that familiar with the, not familiar at all with the contracting numbers. So I would, I would deflect to uh, somebody there in the Pentagon to help you talk specifically uh, about what direction they're trending. I can tell you the few contractors that I work with every day f play a, a very significant role in our operations, uh, but their numbers have not changed at all. As the number of uh, military operations against ISIS in Iraq has gone down, have the numbers of troops in Iraq gone down? And if so, can you give us a, a ballpark number? So, first of all, I wouldn't categorize the number of military operations in Iraq as going down. Uh, what, what has gone down are operations to liberate terrain that ISIS formerly held. But you got to give credit to the Iraqi security forces who, quite frankly, night after night, day after day, are getting out there and getting after uh, whatever they become aware of, or in some instances, just proactively moving out to patrol and secure local areas. 
So that doesn't lend itself to, uh, to anything numbers wise move, move in one direction or the other. As far as U.S. and coalition, oh. With regards to numbers, I would say it's, it's less about numbers as it is about capability. And what I, I think is, can certainly be acknowledged is that what you'll see on our part is a shift, probably a shift in capability is what I would anticipate based on uh, what the needs are going forward. And uh, we lost you for just a, a part of your response, but um, to get back to the shift in capability, so are you seeing the U.S. forces that are there on the ground and the coalition forces there on the ground, um, what they are doing has changed? Yeah, you know, I would categorize it as we were very actively in a position to support the Iraqi security forces as they moved around the country, in some instances simultaneously, to liberate particular areas. Uh, for example, during my tenure here, they left Mosul and went to Talafar and to Hawija and then out west to Al Anbar and Al Qaim. And so our, our positioning and our support was specific to those, to those particular missions. What, what we've done now, uh, in particular on the special operations side, is, is gone where our partners have gone and continue to support them with whatever they deem necessary. Uh, oftentimes it comes in the form of intelligence, planning, some of the things, uh, like I mentioned earlier, exploitation of materials after an operation and that the operations are increasingly done uh, without us physically present with them. Okay, thank you. Sir, if you could uh, identify yourself and your affiliation, please. Rabaz Ali with the Brudal. So, General, uh, Iraqis are preparing for uh, parliamentary elections in mid-May. Are you concerned that um, ISIS and other milita militant groups might increase uh, uh, their activities, um, you know, just to disrupt the uh, the campaigns for, for the elections? So thanks for that question. The, um, the, elect the Iraqi election upcoming in May is actually a very exciting opportunity. And the types of activities that I just described a moment ago in terms of what the Iraqi security forces, local police forces are doing are exactly the types of things that, that they assess and, and I would certainly agree need to be done now to ensure that the conditions are set so we don't have to be concerned about exactly the types of, types of things you just described. And so uh, we're engaged in conversations and planning with our Iraqi counterparts right now uh, to talk about the things that need to be done now and in the ensuing months to prepare for that election actually doing anything to uh, assist the uh, local forces to secure the country in preparation for the elections? At this juncture, uh, with regard to the elections, I would say that we are focused, it, it's really in a planning stage, and with a recognition that operations on any given day, particularly in, in a population, den population dense area like Baghdad, like Mosul, Ramadi, those types of operations that are being done day in and day out by the Iraqi army, by local police forces, and the counterterrorism service are being done to set the conditions for security going forward, but certainly with a mind towards ensuring that, that it is firmly in place prior to the elections in May. Now to Courtney Kuby from NBC. Hi, General Glenn. Uh, it's good to see you back in the Pentagon. Uh, could, could I go back to this, this idea of some remnants of ISIS? Because there's been some confusion in the last month or, so, month or so about how many ISIS fighters are actually still in Iraq and Syria. And there was a number that was put around that was just included where there was coalition fighters. What is the total number, if you have it, of, of ISIS fighters you believe are in, in Iraq, you believe are in Syria, 
And, and does that include these ones who are sort of out and more disparate in the area, in, in, in these cellular structures? Hey, Courtney, thanks for the question. And uh, thanks for the welcome. Uh, I don't have an exact number. In fact, we don't focus on the exact numbers, to be honest with you. In much the same way uh, that we focus on our partners, it's about the capabilities. And so what we see, what, what we're watching closely is, as I mentioned, where are they going? Why are they going there? And at this point, unique to Iraq, why would you want to stay? The so-called caliphate has been dismantled at this point, and so ISIS has no um, recognizable structure of the bureaucracy that they had previously sought to achieve. And, and so with a very, very few and dwindling options here in Iraq, what capabilities are they trying to sustain here and where are they trying to locate them is really what we focus on more than anything else. Have you seen, if, if the consequence or the, the choices there are so bad, have you seen any large numbers of them leaving Iraq? <clears throat> we watch uh, their movement and the Iraqis are, are a great source of that watching um, based on the local populace. And, and we do have evidence that they're moving. It's just not all that coherent. And I frankly don't think that's a lack of understanding on our part. I think that is indicative of the desperation of ISIS at, at this point, uh, trying to bring some coherency uh, to what, what has happened to them in the last, certainly at least in the last year. Thank you. Next to Wyatt Goolsby from EWTN. Thanks. Uh, thanks, General, for doing this, by the way. <clears throat> you talked about uh, Iraqis returning to a sense of normalcy. I'm wondering if there's any insight you can give us about what's happening in the Nineveh region, the Nineveh Plains region, because as you know, there's so many towns and villages where religious minorities like Christians and Yazidis were previously under attack. Are there religious minorities who are returning to their homes? Uh, is there a, more of a sense of normalcy there in that area? Yeah, I'll say it, it, um, it's, really, it's an encouraging situation in most instances that, as I alluded to earlier, that you see more people returning to formerly ISIS-controlled areas than we were previously reporting uh, by aid organizations in 2013. And so, unique to the Nineveh Plains, uh, it, you're exactly right, a very diverse and rich area and an area where there is now a sense of opportunity to return and see what the future may hold. And, and so that's true in a number of areas and, and some places are gonna recover from ISIS's presence quicker than others. Thank you. All right, next to uh, Ryan Brown from CNN. Hello, General, thank you for doing this. Um, quick question on, uh, on the Baghdad suicide attacks. Do attacks like these kind of highlight the need for additional training of Iraqi police? I know the focus had been kind of before on offensive kinetic training. Is this, does there need to be a shift, more coalition advisors with police units? So the bombing in Baghdad, as I mentioned uh, early on, is, you know, I, there's already, I mentioned in my opening comments, I'm trying to harken back, there, there has already been a shift in focus on the part of the Iraqi government and the Iraqi security forces to an, to an emphasis towards local policing and border security. And, and so I wouldn't categorize it as a shift that's necessary. It, it was anticipated uh, th and that, that training, that advising has already begun and, and is ongoing a recognition on the behalf of, uh, of the Iraqis themselves. Just, and one additional question. On, have you, have, have the Iraqis in kind of these mopping up operations, have they apprehended any foreign fighters in the recent months, in the last month? Uh, 
Not not that I'm aware of, but the 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 foreign fighter issue um, in ISIS writ large is one that uh, needs continued attention. I mean, the future of ISIS or organizations like ISIS lie in they had their hopes and aspirations in being holding territory that have all but been shattered and dismantled. At this point, it's a matter of the ideology and what would attract someone from another country to come here to Iraq or to anywhere else in the region and fight on their behalf. And, and so that, that's the focus. And what was it, a month ago maybe, uh, I had the privilege here in Baghdad of attending what was the third annual conference on defeating Daesh propaganda and ideology. And I think that's indicative of the recognition, uh, regional recognition, uh, because it had folks beyond Iraq, pr predominantly Iraqis, but beyond Iraq, uh, with a recognition that, that this is about the ideology and, and uh, getting people to recognize, particularly young people, to recognize that uh, there's no hope in that. Next to Jack Detch from El Monitor. Thanks, General. You've mentioned that sort of a specific focus of this effort now is to reduce ISIS's capabilities and scale those back. Does the coalition have a specific metric or sort of threshold that you're using to reduce ISIS's capabilities that might allow the mission to be scaled back or U.S. troops to leave the region? Uh, particular metric, certainly the, the things that we aspire to support on behalf is that which the Iraqis want as well. And, and so those metrics are security and stability. And I would tell you in the places where I travel to in Iraq, it, it's measured by the ability of local governance to provide essential services by access on the part of the government of Iraq at a federal level, as well as for non-governmental organizations to come in and provide augmentation to those ex essential services that allow Iraqis to return to a normal life. I was uh, traveling the other day and had a conversation with a local gentleman. And, you know, in the end, it really comes down to the same thing you and I want. They want their kids to be able to go out in the street in front of their house and have a soccer game while they're preparing their dinner. And, and so, uh, you know, in terms of a, of a personal metric, when I travel and I talk to local folks, that, that, that's the kind of metric I'm looking for. Got it. And you mentioned at the beginning of your, your remarks that uh, s several thousand CTS are, are scheduled to graduate from academy. Um, does the coalition have an update of how many CTS have been trained? And are you still on track to reach the 20,000 uh, that are expected to be trained by the end of the next three years that the Pentagon mentioned last year? Yeah, so thanks for that question. Uh, CTS is our as our longtime partner uh, on the, both for the uh, U.S. and for special operations, have a very deliberate plan uh, to get themselves refit and refurbished and ready for any emerging threats. And so this week alone, uh, they, they have had the opportunity to rotate some folks back from what they have been doing literally now for two and a half years and get some well-deserved leave and begin to focus on their training plan and some of their equipment updates that need to be provided. Uh, I mentioned the numbers that are in the course now. The, the CTS has a plan, uh, an annual plan, to, get, to keep themselves on track for what they think they need. And, and just like any of the challenges uh, any of the coalition nations face in terms of what their target is, their target's driven by both uh, what capabilities they need how significant the threat is they face, and then, you know, like the rest of us, what can they afford? But I'll tell you, they're on a very good path uh, to maintain their capabilities, and uh, they are, without a doubt, a force that will, it remains focused and dedicated towards the counterterrorism mission and ensuring that things like ISIS do not return to the lands here of Iraq. Sorry, just real quick, are you still on track for that 20,000? Is that still the goal, or has that goal changed specifically for the, for the CTS? Are you not using that as a snapshot? The, the goal itself is an Iraq, it, that's a CTS. 
that's a CTS driven uh, objective. And what, what I would tell you is that is where they started to pl what they started to plan against and the last two and a half years of fighting in urban's env urban environments every single day, uh, they're, they're getting right back to focusing on building their capabilities and less concerned with what number they need right now. Next to Lucas Thomason with Fox News. Uh, General, when Turkey's president says we will strangle U.S. backed force in Syria before it's even born, is that helpful? <laughs> Lucas, the political comments and exchanges are clearly are not in uh, my lane nor in my area of expertise. He's a NATO ally and this affects your forces in Syria and potentially Iraq. Does that give you some concern, General? We pay attention to the dynamics between partners in the area, uh, certainly in the case of Turkey. And as it relates to how they interact on a state to state level, uh, that, that nationally that's something we pay attention to. But where, where we have the most interaction is militarily. Um, and, and so we, we keep track, I keep track more on what they're what their military intentions are. The leader's question, when you said that U.S. Special Operations Forces in Iraq spend 75 to 80 percent of their time advising the Iraqi counterterrorism service, what are you all doing the rest of the time? <laughs> so it's, it's not just the counterterrorism service. It's, it's special weapons and tactics units from the Ministry of Interior. It's uh, other elements, commando unit, units in the, in the Iraqi army. And as far as the other percentage, you know, like I men mentioned, uh, th there's an element of ours that's dedicated to supporting the, the training apparatus, like the question a moment ago about the CTS. And the CTS runs their own academia or school. Uh, what the coalition provides is some oversight and some assistance with development of future programs uh, based on lessons that they have learned from two and a half years of hard fighting and, and what kind of skills they, they want to expand on and improve. Each week, how often do U.S. Special Operations Forces accompany uh, Iraqi forces on raids? We don't, we don't accompany the Iraqi security forces uh, hardly ever at this point. Thank you. Next to Carlo Munoz with Washington Times. Hey, sir, thanks for uh, doing this. Uh, quick follow-up on Jeff and Lita's question about the uh, existence or non-existence of an insurgency in Iraq. Uh, in their claim of responsibility for yesterday's bombing in Baghdad, uh, ISIS propaganda said that this was the beginning of a, quote, vengeance campaign. Uh, which could lead to a string of bombings similar to what we saw in the run-up to the Mosul, the fight for Mosul. Uh, one, I wanted to ask, how does that sort of statement, claim of responsibility, square with what you're picking up from Iraqi security forces as far as the existence of insurgency in Iraq? And two, you mentioned that uh, one of your main requirements is to see what capabilities is uh, Islamic State looking to keep in the country. What are those capabilities? Are they focused on sort of, you know, these, these bomb-making uh, areas or bomb-making facilities that they use to, to great effect in Mosul and elsewhere or other capabilities that maybe relate to more of their conventional military um, skills? So thanks, Carl. I, I w I'm not uh, familiar first with, the, with that statement that ISIS has put out. Uh, claiming responsibility, so I appreciate that insight. Uh, I'll have to go back and take a look at that. The, with regards to the capabilities, the, the types of things that 
we see ourselves, well, I'm trying to remember the first half of your question. It, it related something about insurgency. Could, could you say it again? Uh, sir, I just wanted to, you said earlier that uh, the task force, the, uh, uh, the task force is focusing on looking at what capabilities Islamic State is looking to maintain inside Iraq. I kind of wanted to get some specifics on that. What capabilities are they trying to maintain from what you've seen, what you've picked up from uh, uh, Iraqi security forces? Okay, thanks. Much clearer now. Um, it, it is a little bit early for us to tell exactly I think they'd like to retain as much as they can, uh, but th that's, a, that's an assessment on my part. Uh, certainly the, the, the ability to finance, you know, the, the strengths of ISIS at their peak were their brand and their, their finances. Their brand has been proven uh, completely ineffective and their finances, from everything I, that I can tell, are severely diminished and very much struggling. And so the types of things that the Iraqis are focused on and uh, that we cooperate with them most is on intelligence and how intelligence is integrated and utilized to drive operations, operations that are done to keep pressure on that cellular structure I mentioned earlier. And then, to, to your point about Baghdad, it's also about counter-improvised explosive devices. The types of materials that are necessary to form those things, how they have to be moved, the types of conditions that are, are required in order to put them together. And, and the Iraqis are very much focused on, on precluding those types of things from occurring. And then lastly, of course, is the security side of it. And, and a lot of that shifts from what was clearing swaths of land that ISIS was holding and focused more so on the local security and the border security, the types of things that will allow all the capabilities that I just rattled off to move around and, and try to reform into an effective network. Thanks, sir. All right, next to uh, Kasim Ileri with Anadolu. General Green, thanks for doing this. Uh, I know you're you you are, you know you are focusing on uh, Iraq, but I will follow up on the questions regarding the border security forces in Syria. <clears throat> under which or, uh, or under which legal premises does the coalition form the border security force in Syria, General? For because first there should be a defined and recognized border before you form a board, border security to protect that border. Uh, which legal premises lead co coalition to that decision? Okay, so like I said earlier, and, and you acknowledge, my, my focus here in Iraq um, doesn't put me in a position to comment on that directly. W what, what I will say is that border security in this region remains a concern for everyone in the region. And it's a common objective to ensure that ISIS is unavailable, is unavailable and, and not able to move aspects of their, whatever remaining capabilities they might have around to build a structure that could threaten any government in the area considering YPG, which is part of the SDF, as a connected group to the PKK, that's a terrorist organization. And Turkey is angered by that decision, saying that the U.S. has said that they will stop arming, giving, providing arms to the YPG after the defeat of ISIS. Now, the U.S. is forming a 30,000 troop or force and give it under, to the, under the leadership of the SDF, which is led by YPG, which Turkey considers to be a part of PKK. So how do you situate this into, into the specific U.S. mission in Syria with respect to mm, defeating or uh, fighting ISIS and the alliance with Turkey, of course? So again, my, my focus here in Iraq uh, doesn't, 
doesn't really get me a, a whole lot of information. You clearly have more information on, the, on that than I do. Next to Anna Varfumileva from Globe Post. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, General, thank you for doing this. Um, I just want to follow up on Ryan's question um, and clarify something. Are there any plans to transfer Iraqi military personnel to civilian policing or counter-terror roles at the moment? I missed the beginning of that. Could you, could you repeat that, please? Are there any plans to transfer Iraqi military personnel to civilian policing or counterterrorism roles? Oh, okay, I understand the question, thanks. Uh, there are a number of discussions going on now uh, to, about the capabilities that the Iraqi security forces have, uh, where they reside, and where they're needed most. And so, to your point, uh, there are or could be uh, opportunities for folks who have performed one function previously uh, to shift to another one going forward. And, and as I've mentioned several times now, clearly I would say the two most opportunistic areas would be local policing and border security. Is there anyone already in training at the moment shifting these roles? Is there training in those particular areas? Is that, is that what you're in, saying? No, I'm trying to shift this role, trying to shift to policing from military. Uh, I, I don't exactly know uh, in, in individual cases. I do know that, that there's a considerable effort going into, into police training as well as border guard training. And, and both of those began uh, well, they've been ongoing throughout, but th there has been a definite increase in emphasis on those two particular areas uh, since operations out in Al Anbar in terms of clearing ISIS controlled areas concluded back in the middle of December. Thank you. Next, we'll go to uh, Tom Squidieri from Talk News Media. Talk News Media. Uh, happy Tuesday, General. I'm pulling together some of your responses to earlier questions and noted that you said most of the missions now is not to clear territory, but to secure territory and restore normalcy. How much, uh, pulling another figure out of the air, as you did earlier, how much territory still needs to be cleared of ISIS, please? Uh, here in Iraq, Tom, um, it has all been cleared once, so an easy answer would be none. Uh, the reality, though, back to what I mentioned about ISIS remnants, is the Iraqis continue to see enough opportunities that they're going back to areas of concern. Uh, it was mentioned earlier uh, about, about the uh, Tuz Kermatu region and Hawija. And they go back to revisit those areas and to determine whether or not there's people that uh, need, to be, need to be addressed and potentially captured or at least spoken to, as well as, as you heard in my opening remarks, the number of IEDs and um, caches of explosive materials uh, continues to be pretty substantial. And it's, it's those kinds of work when, when we talk about going back and clearing particular areas, uh, that, that, that's the kind of work that's ongoing at this time. Clearing that up. <laughs> Next to Tima Kirsan from Al Jazeera English. Thank you for doing this, General. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm wondering what is the, so as you talk about shifting to advising, it seems like there are a couple of gaps with the Iraqi local forces in certain areas. Um, an example, obviously, being the double suicide bus bombings. Do you think that with the shift uh, that those kind of concerns will continue? Basically, is the, is the shortfall with the local training, is it a training issue? No, so I, I wouldn't so much categorize it as a shift. 
the advising and assisting uh, has been ongoing uh, for the entire time that the coalition has been side by side with the Iraqi security forces. What, what as was asked earlier, what, what we've done much less of is the accompanying, so the direct support. And what that has allowed is an emphasis on the training and the preparation. And so that's where, that's where much of our attention is now, and, and that's, that's at the request of our partners. And, and so it, it's working very well. Uh, Louis Martinez, ABC. Hey, General. Um, two questions. One on the training aspect that you've talked about. Um, you talked about intelligence being something that you're providing right now um, as, they move, can, can, as CT continues in its operation. Is that a capability that you're training them uh, specifically organically to the special operations uh, community in Iraq? And uh, how long do you think that process is going to take? Hey, Lewis, thanks. Thanks for the question. Good to hear your voice. Uh, the, so let's start with the, the Iraqi intelligence. Uh, very good. They, when we say you categorize it as we're providing it to them, I, I would more so say we, on a daily basis, have an e increasing awareness of, of just how good and effective their intelligence is. And so it's much more a case of us providing some advice on how that can best be integrated into what they're planning and the kind of assessments they're making of what any organization, in this case, will stay focused on ISIS, may be trying to do. And so, well, well, we could continue to work side by side in the intelligence area alone um, for, for quite some time and are, would be happy to at the request of our, our friends and partners in the Iraqi security forces. Quite honestly, uh, they'd, be, they'd be capable of doing it without our help today. So you, you have this, do they have an enhanced capability? Um, do you bring enhanced capabilities to them as well with regards to intelligence that maybe you may want to transfer to them um, in the future as an enduring capability? Yes, there, there, are, there are definitely some, some capabilities, uh, often technical, that for security reasons, you know, obviously aren't transferable. Um, and so we will, at their request, continue to support them with those kinds of technical, the kind of technical assistance. But again, an increasingly capable uh, intelligence infrastructure and it's the, it's the kind of areas that um, intelligence to prepare for operations, the Iraqi security forces have been doing for quite some time and obviously have more experience with it than most of the rest of the world based on the last two and a half, three years. As an example, what I would offer to you is where, where some of our advice and assistance is focused now is on after an operation when there are there is information available on documents or on technical on, on a on a laptop, for example. The exploitation of that that types of stuff is what we're increasingly find ourselves partnered with and, and teaching going forward. Thanks for that. And just one last question: um, During the battles for uh, Mosul and elsewhere, what we saw were special operations being used in large scale formations. Uh, it's a little different than I think the original concept for special ops uh, forces. Um, how did you, how did your teams adjust uh, to that type of mission planning versus what I guess is now a return to a more uh, agile uh, force uh, capability that I think is what is happening now against these cells? Yeah, Lewis, another good question. Um, the, our teams in particular, we, well, we were at the point, at this juncture, we were at the point where we knew what we were getting into, and so we're well prepared uh, to, to provide that kind of advice and assistance. And the, the other half of it was that what we were asking, in this case, uh, the counterterrorism service and commando units to do in Iraq 
were the types of things that uh, many of us would see as light infantry skill sets. And so, the, for example, the Counterterrorism Service has, has a very good capability in that regard at this point. What we're doing literally this week uh, is having a conversation with their Counterterrorism Service uh, about the training plan they've put together for themselves to get back focused on those elite counterterrorism school skills that they that they perceive they're going to need most and the ones that they're going to need soonest uh, in anticipation of ensuring a stable situation here in Iraq and as was asked earlier particularly in a run up to an election here later this spring we are nearly at one hour so we'll go to uh, last question we'll go to Lori Milroy from McCurstan 24 uh, thank you i just want to follow up on stability operations can you give us a rough estimate of the number of in IDPs who have returned to their homes versus the number who are still in camps and, and they're still displaced? I can get somebody there in the Pentagon to get you the numbers. I, I don't have them immediately at my fingers, but I do, as I mentioned in the opening comments, uh, I do increasingly see as I travel and interact uh, with the UN and w with others that uh, IDPs are returning to areas from where they came, uh, in particular to familial areas uh, wh where they had family or have family, to tribal areas. And there's a growing, uh, a growing attitude of returning and rebuilding. But as far as the exact numbers go, I'm not 100% sure. I can have somebody there in the planning yeah. and get them for you. And as you transition to stability operations, how does that change the composition of the U.S. presence in Iraq? Does that mean more contractors, State Department? Are you more engaged in stability operations than the conventional army? So I'd like to clarify the question a little bit you know as you, as you say as we transition to stability operations i wouldn't i wouldn't that wouldn't be the way i i would poise it to be honest I, I would say that the we remain focused the iraqi uh security forces remain focused on the security aspect of it and and that's where we remain uh side by side in advising and assisting so that doesn't shift things too much. Now, what's the end state of that security is to provide a stable local situation that allows for essential services, allows for clearing and rebuilding. Uh, in terms of what, what that means for us going forward, uh, most of you have heard General Funk say in the past, and, and he says it to us on a regular and recurrent basis, we're not going to have more, one more soldier, sailor, airman, marine, contractor here uh, then we assess we need to do what we're being asked to do by the government of Iraq. What you, I think I can say with certainty uh, and, and absolute confidence is, I think what we'll see is a shift in what the capability of the force is here. And, and what those capabilities will be, we'll, we'll, we'll go back uh, along the lines of, of those types of things that we're seeing most frequently in terms of intelligence and counter IED and security advising and, and some of the counterterrorism skills that we just talked about a moment ago. General Blunder, thank you very much for taking the time to brief the press corps here. Do you have any uh, closing words for the group? There's uh, some familiar voices. I can't see you all, but there's some familiar voices in there. So happy new year to you all. And I appreciate you spending an hour with me. And we'll, we'll tell you, if you need anything in the interim, you, you know where to find us. We're here just about all day, every day. So uh, drop a line anytime. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Have a great day.